hope you don't mind, but it's kind of challenging this time of year for me personally because it's not that I don't enjoy Christmas or I don't enjoy Hanukkah, that I don't enjoy New Year's, but we all have, as it were, certain rhythms and cycles that we go through. That's kind of what the Bible says or means when it says, there's a purpose under the sun. To everything there's a purpose under the sun, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to live, a time to cry, a time to do all those things that it talks about. But there's also a time that you find throughout the year, if you're aware of it, that you are either more active or less active. And you go through these cycles. They're, they used to be called biorhythms. And it's just the observation of your natural reaction or your natural action that the body goes through. It isn't meant to be something that's, you know, new age or humanist, but it's just a, it's a reality. It's a fact of nature. It's something that the Creator, our God, created in us. And it was meant to be honored in many ways by some of the feast days that we have. It's meant to be made aware of by God's laws for us, sometimes instructing us not so much to do them in order to be made righteous, but sometimes to do them in order to just have a better life. It's kind of like using common sense. Well, you're using God's sense. So for me... Sometimes I get weary at this time of year and I can't deal with a lot of the same issues that I normally can. Meaning like the time of the year there's also, besides, I believe, the joy of Christmas that you can celebrate Santa Claus and Rudolph and Frosty as easily as you could celebrate the Nativity and Jesus and saying Merry Christmas and Happy New Year and cool Kwanzaa and Hag Sameach and Hanukkah and everything else. That it's always a choice of what you do with them and who you involve in it. If you bring God in it, then guess what? You know, it's the, how can you go wrong if God is there? And Jesus took this time of year and he enjoyed it and celebrated it. Not because it was his birthday, but because it was a time and an opportunity for him to use it as a demonstration of who God his Father was. So, we use the holidays to point to the Holy One, who is the sum of all holy days. We don't try to make the day holy, we don't try to make the season holy, we don't try to change people from their celebrations. Celebrate Christmas, celebrate Santa Claus, celebrate New Year, celebrate the tree, oh, Tenenbaum, celebrate whatever you want to. The point is, it's not cultic and it's not an idol. But for me, this time of year brings out also a lot of the kooky people. You know, they, they seem to get like kind of off kilter because of the lack of sunlight and they seem to spend more time on the internet so they don't get enough natural light and it affects them so they get seasonal adjustment disorder, dysfunction disorder. Sads, as it were. And a lot of times that's communicated through their choices of what they're going to personify God as. as they go after seeking arcs or, or Ark of the Covenant or Noah's Ark. Or they, they go after signs and wonders. They go after all these other things. But they don't look to Jesus. And I, I am always depressed about that. It... It bothers me. And then you see at this time of year, children that are being portrayed as adults, you know, and they're always exploited in some particular way that people don't feel like they're exploiting them and they're using them for their own ministry gain or to get a click on the internet or to supposedly show off their children what they can do, but somebody had to train them into doing something that they don't normally do. And God told us that we're supposed to train up the children in the way that they should go and they would not depart from it when they're old. And if that means becoming a rock star, I think we're training them up in the wrong way. If you're teaching your children to be a worship leader, I don't think that's what you want to do because Satan was a worship leader. Lucifer. So, I think you want to train up a child in knowing what to do when they sin, knowing who to go to, Jesus, knowing that they should have a personal relationship with God through the Son, knowing that they should ask for the Holy Spirit in their life to lead them, to guide them, to teach them, to instruct them, and to point to them God our Father and to reveal to them Jesus' Son. I think you want to train them in all these other things 
and maybe even give them a vocation and an education rather than some kind of temporary satisfaction for yourself in order to see your child, you know, standing on stage, worshipped? Uh, I don't think so. So it depresses me this time of year and always gets to me. So sometimes all of that overwhelms me. So today I'm, I'm overwhelmed and <coughs> not feeling 100%. And when I don't, I always turn to Jesus. I always realize that God didn't say, I want you to go and do these things like share devotionals or record videos or talk about me when you feel like it. He just said, do it, and then you'll feel like it. And for me, my health comes from sharing Jesus. I don't feel good, and I kind of, uh, you know, run down unless I do talk about God. So that's why you see me now kind of like, uh, you know, maybe played out. And some people say, well, born again Christians can't be played out. They got the Holy Spirit. Well, <laughs> okay. If you want to get into a spiritual contest, you know, then you, you go ask God about me and I'll go ask God about you and I'll let you decide for yourself what God thinks about me as he tells you about me and where my condition is right now being such that I am, and I'll let God tell me about you, and I'll just love you anyways, because guess what? I already know how God thinks about you, so he's already saved you, so I already know that he loves you so much that he died and gave his son for you, so I don't have to worry about what my thoughts are towards you. But if you think that somehow there's sin in my life because I don't feel good or I, my health is down, well, you know, you'll get over it. Don't worry. As soon as you get sick, you'll forget about that theology. But this time of year brings me always to the same place every year and that's always one of winding down feeling kind of like oppressed and then sure enough this enemy does attack me this time of year and I'm very much under spiritual attack so if you want to pray pray for me you know however Lord leads you you know I don't really care if you do or don't because you know I give it to God and God whatever you know you do it you you got it you do it you help if not okay you know let me learn from it but My point in sharing this and being real about it and sitting here, you know, kind of weak, in a weakened state, is to also manifest to you the truth that you should never hide who you are. You should always be truthful about what you feel. You should always act in accordance to the reality of Jesus being in you, who is the truth, the way, and the light. That you should never try to put on spiritual airs or try to pretend you're not sick when you are. Don't pretend that you're holy when you're not. Don't try to pretend that you're righteous when you're not. I tell people, hey, shut down the cameras, you know, and in five minutes leave me alone and I'll sin. You know, I mean, if not in thought, then in word. If not in word, then in deed. If not in deed, then in word and thought and deed. You know, one way or another, sin is waiting at my door, you know, to just come knocking and walking right in the house, you know, and we have to resist these times that we live in because it is an evil generation and an evil age, and it is the end of the world. So we are under constant oppression, but we're also under a constant deception of trying to get us off track from what we should be on track about. And that's a personal relationship with Jesus because only he can guide you through this minefield of life that we live in. Only he can give you the words that you need to meet your day every day as you live it. Because you will find that in every circumstance of your life, there is a better way to approach it. And that is God's way. And God will tell you what he wants you to do. It's not a question of opening up a Bible and reading it like an instruction book. Although it can work that way, the Holy Spirit can make it applicable to you. But sometimes there's particular circumstances and things he wants you to do in your day that he will speak to you and talk to you and let you know what he wants you to do today as you hear his voice. That's why we're told, today harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, for if we do, then we hear not his voice and we don't yield ourselves and our will to doing what he wants us for his will to be done. Opportunity brings opposition. But he who looks carefully into the faultless law 
the law of liberty and is faithful to it and pers perseveres in looking into it, being not a heedless listener who forgets, but an active doer who obeys, he shall be blessed in all his doings in his life of obedience. To obey is better than sacrifice. Many people agree with a sermon or a scripture, but they don't apply it in their everyday life, so nothing changes. They think that they that just because they agree with the word, it should bring change into their life. They say, "Oh yeah, that's a good word, but you know, I that's you know, God, you make it work and you know, figure it out." But change doesn't happen automatically. A person has to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. Which isn't to say that we get into this idea of works of righteousness that make us more holy. But no, it's rather like if God says, bad company corrupts good morals, well then don't go to a strip club. I mean, that's common sense, or is it? Is it common sense because there are people that think they can go to a strip club? Or is it common sense that you have all your hard rock friends over on Thursday night, and then on Friday night you think that you're not going to go out and party? Or is it common sense that says, look, you know, if you reap what you sow, then guess what? If you constantly fill your mind full of temptation, you will give in to temptation. So if you're going to watch porno, you're going to react to temptation in your life and screw up a relationship with your wife or your loved ones, whoever it may be, or your husband. As women, likewise, are just as much guilty of being enticed by thoughts, whether it be in soap opera or um, romance novels, or in some way enticed into feeling the emotive quality of our flesh and not yielding to the spiritual dynamic that controls the emotive quality. One of the most beautiful things there should be as far as the subject of sex is concerned is that there should be a dynamic trilateral experience, trilateral triunity experience of body, soul, and spirit combined in the reality of two people meeting and becoming one. That's supposed to be what sex, as we call it nowadays, which really was meant to be the unity of body, soul, and spirit with another being that is physical, that is emotional, that is spiritual, connects. And God, in His holiness, comes to them in that presence of oneness and is one with them. The same as the Father and the Son and the Spirit are one. You and your wife, or your wife and you, or you and your husband, I was trying to think of both genders because I'm feeling sick. You and your husband or you and your wife are meant to be one with God in the presence of, pardon the expression, I can't think of the word to make it holy, you know. In making love, if you want to use that word, and that's not the word I'm trying to think of, but in, in copulation, that's supposed to be the unity of Father, Son, and Spirit personified in husband, wife, and Spirit of God. It's a creative process here. Guess what? That's what's supposed to be. God is present. If you don't know that, well, God lives inside you, so guess what? He's there too, so you got to understand that. So, if you really wanted to get away from the worldly carnal garbage that's out there to, oh, how to satisfy your wife in a Christian way, and all these stupid books about some kind of adding the worldly lusts into the Christian world, you know, that sometimes these sex parties are trying to sell sex toys to people to play with in Christianity, let's get real about what the reality of the spiritual dimension is supposed to be like and go that direction and find out that you would be completely blown away by the reality of what you could experience if God is with you in that what you're seeking to do. Then you'll find the fulfillment of your entire being satisfied that God, man, and woman are present in copulation. They become one as the Father and the Son is one. But oh well, <laughs> my soapbox needs to say that I may go off on tangents when I don't feel good. Because it can be a fever, it can be Crohn's, it can be all kinds of things that wear me down. Mainly it's this time of the year that wears me down. But as God inspires us, then be provided for by His Spirit to take the words that are shared 
from his spirit inside me to you so that you could apply them to your life as the spirit needs and guides. Every time you have an opportunity to believe God for something, you will have a temptation to give up on it. Pray that you will overcome temptation when it comes. There's always a anti-function to a pro-function. In other words, God has light and there's darkness. God has Christ and there's an anti-Christ. God has his spirit and there's an anti-spirit. God has God and there's an anti-God. There's the opposite, you know, that Satan tries to make himself out as God. Typical. But God wants to make us into the image of his son. So instead of making us into the image of God's, God wants to make us into the image of his son who is a God. Or is God, I should say. So there's always that anti-function. There's always a perversion or a corruption of God's way and then Satan's way or the corrupted way. And that's what Satan is. That's what evil is. Evil is a corruption. It is a corruption of good. God saw creation and it was good. Evil came by way of really partially us, partially God, but it is the corruption of good that creates the environment for evil to flourish or evil to be accomplished or evil to happen. And it's that power that is a spiritual power, demonic, that is something that's not of our world, that is in the spiritual realm, that accomplishes itself in the physical reality of where we live today. And so for everything that is good, there is a corruption of that good. For everything that is godly, there is a corruption of the godly. For everything that is right, there is a corruption of what is right. And that's what you can look at in our world and see if you know what the corrupted one is, then look, try to see and turn it around and see what the non-corrupted idea would be. So instead of porno and, and deviant behavior, see what godly realization of the oneness of the unity of the body, soul, and spirit in God with a spouse would be if you knew to look for that in the first place. It's not just a simple song of Solomon and get all sensual about it. No, there's more to it than that. There's God. And the song of Solomon doesn't describe God. But Jesus was trying to imply that when he spoke to his disciples and prayed for them that they would be one even as the Father and the Son is one. Because you can come into a oneness of spirit without having to be in a oneness of flesh. Something to think about when you're feeling down and out like I am. So, in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your path. But in all of your temptations, take it to God of creation and he'll give you an explanation of what's going on in your life today so he can lead you in the way that he wants you to go, whether you feel like it or not. And I don't feel like it. <laughs>